Anyway, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for that um, short delay. Uh, you've obviously all found the link uh, because you made it here. It was Alan and I that had the trouble um, getting in. So thank you very much for your, for your patience. Delighted to see nearly 200 people uh, with us uh, this evening. I'm James Parsons, chairman of the Wells Group of the Institution of, of Structural Engineers. I'm sure many of you will know um, Alan, Alan Hayward, um, and he, he sent me a brief um, resume. I won't read it all because it's, it's, his career is, is quite, quite lengthy, uh, and he will allude to some of this during his talk. But at the age of 17, uh, Alan joined British Railways, as it was then, as, a, as an apprentice civil engineer, and he became absorbed in the practical construction of bridges later working for contractors Dorman Long and Cleveland Bridge. At that stage, Alan was barely conscious of design theory, at least for the first 10 years. He then joined Mott Hay and Anderson, uh, now Mott MacDonald, uh, designing various bridges for highways and railways, and that included cable stage, suspension and box girder types. He was then sent uh, to Indonesia where he designed about 70 precast concrete bridges for a new highway. And then he returned to the UK as chief engineer of Fairfield Maybe, responsible for construction methodology. And from there, he instigated a number of winning alternative steel bridges against often uneconomical conforming designs. It was at Fairfield Maybe uh, coming up 40 years ago when I first met Alan when I was a student. So that ages me uh, as well. In 1983, Alan co-founded bridge specialist Cass Hayward Consulting Engineers, and uh, Cass Hayward provide joint expertise for construction and design. Several bridges over the years have won national awards. The Cass Hayward U-Deck, that we still fondly call it, uh, is, a, is a rail bridge now part of Network Rail's standard um, suite of designs. Alan has been involved with code development, including BS 500, Eurocodes, and the assessment of rail and bridges. So considering he was barely conscious of design theory at the start of his career, that's quite an achievement. He attributes any success that he has to the early sharp end practical experience. Since retirement, Alan continues his interest in bridges, including heritage railways, often as a volunteer. He does have other interests. He also paints and is a lifelong cyclist. He enjoys traveling and a, a good glass uh, of wine. So I'll now hand over to Alan. Thank you for those who, who polled. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my, I'm Alan Hayward, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, repair of heritage railway bridges. Um, I'm only going to cover the bridges that I've been involved in. Um, there are many others, uh, dozens, if not uh, hundreds of uh, heritage railways in the UK, and all of them have got their own uh, problems and lengths of track and locomotives and bridges and so on. So I'm not going to cover the whole subject, of course, just uh, six or seven railways where I've got involved in one way or another, um, generally as a volunteer. And then uh, I sometimes call the cavalry in when it's got to be designed properly. Here we are. Um, some acknowledgements, first of all, um, and just going through the railways I'm going to talk about, the Dean Forest Railway, which is down, of course, South Wales area. Then over to the north, up north to the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Then the Gloucestershire Warwick and Steam Railway. The Great Central, right in the middle of the country. Then the Robber Valley Railway down in Kent. Then up north again to the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway. Famous uh, for the film Railway Children, some uh, 40 years ago, of course. You, many of you will know that. And finally, a bit about Barmouth Bridge which of course is not a heritage railway, but it is a heritage structure. So I think it was worth putting that in. Um, 
I put names of various people who helped me for all of this. I couldn't have done any of this on my own. And you'll see some pretty expert names in there. Um, expert people, for example, Roger Bastin, who works on the North Yorkshire Moors these days, um, but was um, engineer of the Eastern region of British Rail some years ago. So a real expert. I mentioned John Sreeves, who's been involved with a lot of the uh, heritage railways. He's a former Halcro engineer, um, but he's still very much involved in the heritage railway scene. And I'll just mention at the bottom, Martin Welsh um, on the Keithley and Worth Valley. Uh, the reason for mentioning him is that uh, he designed uh, what was my really, my first real adventure into railway bridges when I was about 23 years old. And we met up again uh, 50 years later, which is quite remarkable. I'm going to try and move on now. Just a bit of back history now. This is the bridge uh, I just mentioned. Uh, it's at South Hampstead in London, carries the Great Central Railway coming out of Marylebone um, across the West Coast main line out of Houston. And that bridge had to be reconstructed in 1964. It was in bad condition. Um, a really challenging site. It's surrounded on three sides by tunnels and on the fourth side by a railway station. So access to the site was impossible uh, except by rail and any cranes and even a bag of cement had to come in on a train. I mean, there's no way of getting to the place otherwise. Very challenging bridge. You can see at the bottom of the screen there, the three span bridge and um, in three successive weekends, um, the reconstruction was done. Um, I did the concept and the construction methods, um, everything from where the cranes were going to stand, how the way they supported, and the various things we use by sliding in equipment using Slingsby skates and folding wedges and all sorts of old fashioned equipment. And the cranes, of course, are now old fashioned railway breakdown cranes. But at the time, the one in the foreground, the 75 ton um, Cow and Sheldon crane was, was still state of the art, actually. The detailed design of that bridge was done by Martin Welsh, um, who I think has clocked in tonight, hopefully. Um, and he did all the detailed design calculations and drawings. Uh, I just conceived the bridge and did all the construction side. Um, but that really was my experience in the early days, um, not real design in, in the theory, um, but just how to build the bridge. So I'm moving on now to one of the heritage railways. This is the Dean Forest Railway. Um, which comes up from Ligny going north and is on the lines of, I think I've missed one slide there. Perhaps we haven't. Um, no, we're right. Um, this is a little bridge um, over a river just north of Ligny and the railway was hopefully going to be extended north towards Park End um, in the Forest of Dean, a former coal mining area and metal extraction and the there was a whole network of lines in the Forest of Dean at one time originally horse-drawn tramways and later converted to railway and this stretch in fact even went over to Brunel's broad gauge for a few years and then was converted back to standard gauge again um, and um, this particular bridge um, it was soon after I'd retired in about the year 2000 and I found out about this bridge by accident that um, the railway were worried about it. Um, they were trying to extend the railway northward from this point towards Park End from Lydney. And uh, they were worried about this bridge, the condition of it. They'd actually ordered the new timber deck for it, but wondered what to do about the steel beams, which were in a pretty shocking condition. And you can see here where they took the timbers off, um, the edge main girder, very corroded. And some of the cross girders are in fact hanging from the main girder, which is always bad news, hanging from rivets is something uh, pretty bad practice, um, but the thing had lasted a long time anyway. But the steel beams were in an atrocious condition. So it was what to do about it. And uh, they decided to call me in. 
So what we did is um, have some new steel beams made, which we gal had galvanized for long life and uh, put them in place of the existing ones. And to relieve the edge beam, the green beam that you see of load, we introduced a different arrangement of steelwork. So you never put any load on that edge girder. Uh, it would just be repainted and repaired to some extent and uh, to reflect the general appearance of the structure. But all the load bearing for, for railway traffic is these uh, galvanized beams. And then the timber floor was put back on the top. Um, the old bridge was pretty crude in many ways. There were no bedstones to, to rest the beams on. They were literally just into the masonry, uh, which was pretty random sort of masonry. And I've often wondered why these old beams didn't just slice their way down the abutments like a knife through butter, but they didn't. So what I decided to do was put a substantial steel pad underneath each beam to spread the load and then just build the thing in. A bit crude. Um, the railway were worried about getting things going quickly, so that was the solution. And then the first public train ran sometime in 2001. Excuse my move on buttons, it seemed to operate. Now there's another bridge on I got involved with uh, at the same time, a thing called St Mary's Footbridge. And um, this bridge had been built in 1892, quite a nice old Victorian lattice girder thing. Um, but um, I was asked to go and look at it and I virtually condemned it. Um, although it was standing up all right, there was some corrosion and the stair treads and the general surface was just dangerous for, for pedestrians. So I suggested it ought to be condemned until it could be repaired. And I did some sketches of how, what I saw of how that could be done. But basically the thing just got put in a drawer um, because there was no money to do anything with it. But it's a listed structure. So eventually it attracted some money. Um, so maybe has got the job of taking it down, taking it to works and restoring it, which they did very well. And here's the, one of the staircases um, coming back from works. And then the bridge was open to great ceremony um, in uh, 2019, so about two years ago, and it had a grand opening. And, and I, I suspect that bridge has never seen that number of pedestrians. Um, and it was opened by the Grand Sheriff of Gloucestershire, no less, to a great ceremony. And I think you'll find Anne and I somewhere in that audience. And actually, I, I said, well, how did you do the restoration after all those years? What drawings did you use? They said, oh, we just dug out your old sketches, which I'd lost, but they'd got them. So that sorted that out. We now move on to the North Yorkshire Moors Railway um, up in, uh, of course, in, in North York Moors, very scenic place. And um, Roger Bastin, of course, has been looking after the bridges on, on this railway as an ex, um, let's say, bridge engineer of the Eastern region of British Rail. This particular bridge, Bridge 30 over Ella Beck, over a, a bit of a river, on the Skew, bridge with a very interesting history. Um, you can see the girders here, the uh, main girders. In fact, parts of them, the top flange in particular, was cast iron and the rest of it was raw iron. And over the years, it had to be strengthened by channels, steel channels added onto the cast iron top flange. I mean, it is a really peculiar structure. And then at, in about 1906, the bridge was strengthened with this inserted girder underneath, um, halfway in the width, which was slotted into the abutments and was just supported at that time on folding wedges. And in fact, wedges just support the cross girders throughout the length. And the thing is really a, a mess, I suppose you could say. Um, the longitudinal timbers uh, for supporting the rails had been strengthened up with the uh, beams either side there. And the bridge was um, had a lot of problems with maintenance. And it was eventually decided it uh, the superstructure should be reconstructed. So the abutments were in pretty good condition. 
So that was what was uh, set about. And in fact, Cass Hayward, I got involved, but uh, Cass Hayward were brought in by Roger. And um, so how do we do the reconstruction? It was going to be just a single track, whereas originally the bridge had been double track. And you can see below the cross section that it was decided upon uh, using composite girders with a precast deck on the top, uh, a much more modern form of construction just for single track. So you might, where did that cross section come from? Well, it came from 1963. Um, I was resident engineer on this bridge, uh, at Bushy on the West Coast main line. And you can see a very similar looking construction, two girders underneath, precast units. Um, the shear connection is by these uh, little beams welded on, whereas today we'd use shear studs. Um, but other than that, it's much the same. The novel feature was using a forklift truck to erect the precast units. That was pretty uh, way out at the time. It's been done since on a few bridges. And other features here, this was replacing old uh, wrought iron box girders from Stevenson, Robert Stevenson's time. Other novel feature you may notice the use of interlacing of the tracks temporarily so that one track is reconstructed at a time. So that was where that came from. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, they say you should uh, ignore what your fathers did, but go back to what your grandfathers did. That might work. So you can see that 50 years and more later, a very similar looking construction, a rather modern looking forklift truck, and the precast units are somewhat uh, updated, uh, forming robust curbs to prevent control derailments and the shear studs are of course welded studs from the modern area, area which came in in the 1960s I guess. The other feature is the use of the, uh, this rail crane, a Kirov crane of which uh, three were um, purchased in about 2005 mainly for permanent way work on the railway rather than bridge work but they've now um, been used quite a bit for bridge work um, very much modernized version of the old breakdown cranes, telescopic jib, and um, with the ability, in fact, to travel with the load, um, travel with quite a load, such that a bridge like this of something over 20 meters span, you can erect with one crane from one end, and you can actually travel with a girder. So this is really a breakthrough as far as rail cranes goes. And the capacity is 125 tons compared with the 75 we have with the breakdown cranes. And you can see top left there, the old center girder being lifted out, weighing 33 tons. There's no way you could have done anything like that with the old uh, breakdown cranes. And then finally, bottom right, you see the official opening by Pete Waterman um, in 2010. So we move on now to a second bridge on the North York Moors. This is a Gothland, um, very picturesque setting, of course. And you can see here a, a plate girder bridge over river. And this was getting into bad condition. Uh, Roger, in fact, said, we'll reconstruct this one. Let's call in uh, Cass Hayward to do a design and sort it out. But this siding on the left with the, the, the uh, wagons with sleepers on, um, that was going to carry very little traffic on just a siding, so we would leave that as it was. But we would reconstruct the part under the two main tracks with the, with the steam engines, as you see, um, by slewing the tracks, getting rid of this centre girder, and just having two new girders on the sides. So here you see the reconstruction with the, uh, the two tracks slewed together so that you get the girders either side there and leaving the old construction carrying the siding. 20 meter span with a, with a quite a skew on it. I found out that nearly all the bridges we have problems. They're either on skew track alignments or they're on curve track, something about that. Here's the bridge, um, the old steelwork being taken out, which was in pretty bad state. On the right, you can see what was uh, supposed to be the bearing. Um, most of these old railway bridges didn't really have bearings as we understand them now. You just landed the girder on the masonry of the abutment, often with two layers of felt as here or 
possibly a sheet of lead um, or nothing much, a, a thin steel plate perhaps. But you can see here, there's, uh, it's all survived. Uh, I do wonder sometimes, do you really need bearings to bridges? I think they got their merit, but um, I think we overrate them. And of course the mood now, um, modern era, is to have bridges without bearings at all and have integral bridges and you in fact make your superstructure monolithic with the abutments, which is a good move of course. Bearings are maintenance, can be maintenance problems. You can see here the new steelwork being uh, trial assembled in the, the works of Cleveland Bridge, who were the steelwork contractor, um, the top firm in the country, of course, for, for big steel bridges. And the, a, a, a trial erection or trial assembly like this is an absolute must for railway bridges to uh, make sure everything fits together. And if it doesn't fit, you make it fit. By means I will not mention, <laughs> sometimes, uh, unorthodox. One feature of uh, this bridge, you see the trimmer girder under the end supporting the what we call the trimmed cross girders, the short ones, and uh, this I call a sit-on trimmer, uh, which I've used on a number of bridges. The merit of it can be that if you want to put your bearings in different places, which you sometimes want to, if you want to put them inside, in, inside of the girders, or sometimes on the outside, if you're building a bridge and the foundations you want to be built clear of rail traffic, you can extend your trimmer out as a cantilever um, and support the bridge in that way. So it's a very useful technique. And the other merit is where the trimmed cross girders sit on the uh, sit on trimmer, the connection is very simple. I mean, you just sit on with about four bolts. It's, uh, it's not complicated at all. Notice that as well, the permanent Concrete sill uh, supporting the bridge has been included in the trial assembly. That's another very good feature. And it's something Cleveland have turned their skills to in, in also manufacturing items like this, the concrete items, although they are mainly a steel firm. Here's the bridge um, erected and permanent formwork between the cross girders uh, ready to be concreted. And the bridge again uh, assembled, the deck now concreted um, and, and to be waterproofed. Uh, waterproofing is something very important on, on bridges to, to prevent corrosion and um, prove to be a, a nasty point on some old bridges when, which haven't been waterproofed. And here's the bridge, 25th of March is a bit of a, in 2000 and last year, 2020, um, that was about the first or second day of the, of the big lockdown, of course. Um, so lucky to finish the bridge at that time. And I haven't got a picture of the uh, first steam train to cross. So uh, Picasso got out his uh, pen and ink and watercolors. And uh, this one may get hung in the National Gallery, but I, I shouldn't think so. Moving on to the Gloucestershire and Warwick Steam Railway now, um, in the Cotswolds, of course. And um, John Sreeves, who I mentioned earlier, um, who was involved in a lot of these uh, heritage lines, uh, we got involved with him and um, he's done several bridges on that line. We've been involved with at least two of them. This is a very small one, uh, just across a farm track. And, um, that was giving cause for concern and its capacity. Now the cross section of it, it had uh, steel troughs. So the sort of thing that was rolled by Dorman Long from about 1890 or so um, with just concrete topping. And it was somewhat corroded, but not too badly. Um, but to upgrade it for, for better, higher loading, we decided to make it composite by infilling the troughs with uh, modern concrete and inserting these steel beams into the wells of the troughs uh, to increase the strength. And to make the whole thing composite, there were various bolts connecting everything together. Um, and, and then the thing was filled with concrete. And uh, at the ends of the bridge, the concrete was turned down the, behind the abutment. That's quite an important feature with the waterproofing uh, over the top and down the back 
to run any water off the back and into a proper drainage. That is an, it's a very desirable feature on these bridges to take the water away um, from where it can do damage. Another little bridge, a little diff different this one. Um, top right, you'll see that the track is carried on what we call longitudinal timbers. That is a, a large bulk of timber uh, beneath each rail resting in a trough, a steel or wrought iron trough. And you can see bottom left, um, the timber's been taken out and you can see the construction of the trough. And of course, in that condition, the timber um, gets very wet and um, you get water collecting in the trough. Corrosion occurs that you can't really see. The timber rots and uh, it's just, uh, just a pretty bad construction really. There's not, not a lot to prevent track spread or gauge widening which can cause derailments. Um, there was um, quite a bit of corrosion at the ends, bottom right, of course, you can see. Notice uh, in the top left elevation, there's very little construction depth. In other words, the depth from rail level down to soffit, very small. Um, that's the, if you like, the advantage of this type of construction. You get, it's very shallow, but of course in reconstructing it, you can't do anything else. You're stuck with troughs or something very like it. The most important uh, design consideration I've ever found in bridges is construction depth, CD we call it. Um, the CD is usually critical on any bridge and it really decides the form of construction. Now I've mentioned that longitudinal timbers are, ba are bad news. Um, I'm very conscious of that. I was an expert witness on one, um, the Bexley derailment in 1995, a heavy freight train which was going too fast, um, traveled across this bridge and just split the longitudinal timbers. The rail spread apart and the train derailed and the four people were badly wounded. And there are several features of this. The timbers were rotten. The train was going too fast. It was doing uh, nearly 60 miles per hour instead of 40. The wagons, which should have been a one wagon instead of being 100 ton was 130 tons. So all the features for producing a derailment. I usually find in these accidents, there's always more than one cause. And of course there are three causes here, but the main ones was the condition of these timbers. You can see in uh, cross section there, there was a model made and you can see that the timber was actually formed of three separate timbers, supposedly connected together where there wasn't much connecting them together. And um, afterwards it was found that there was hardly anything packing the sides of the timber against the trough either. So it was an absolute recipe for a pack of cards failure, if you like. And that's what happened. Just a, a point in expert witnesses, lawyers um, will always defeat you, their magic with their words. But if you produce a model, they can't really argue with that. They don't know how to. So there's the, uh, um, as the bridge was, is above there. You can see it carried two tracks at one time. Um, we had to put troughs, new troughs back, but the difference is the troughs are in fact just consisting of two separate beams with a space below. So water can drain out and the timber is supported by some little cross members. So at least um, water can drain away and as a chance it uh, may have a longer life, but it's still not an ideal form of construction. Well, I'm gonna move on now to the Great Central Railway in the middle of the country. And the, everyone's heard of the Great Central Main Line. Um, it was called the last main line to be built in the UK. It was the last one before HS1 was built, of course. Uh, finished in or opened in 1899 from uh, outskirts of Sheffield or Annesley down through Nottingham and. Um, down through Loughborough, Leicester, Rugby, uh, Aylesbury and down into London, 1899, when most of the main railways had been built, of course. So this one came along as a bit of an interloper and certainly the Midland Railway, this is the, the one underneath, uh, London to Derby and Nottingham and Sheffield and so on. Um, they didn't really want the Great Central, but they said, well, 
if you're going to cross us, um, you've got to have a four span breach because we, we might want to widen to have more tracks in these outer spans in the future. So you've got to have four spans. So the Great Central had to do that. But of course, in the 1960s, the Great Central, which had never made money, um, was always losing money. And British Rail decided to close the whole thing up in the 1960s. And that's what happened. So eventually they closed most of it and they took this bridge down. And so when the preservation companies came along, um, there was no way of getting across the Midland Main Line. So what you got stuck with is two heritage railways, one which runs up from Leicester up to Loughborough, and then it has to stop because there's no way across the Midland Main Line. And another preservation or heritage line runs north to the outskirts of Nottingham. Um, the total length is about 18 miles. So you've got about eight miles on this southern section and about 10 miles the northern section. The great dream of these uh, heritage railways is to join the whole thing up. And that's been, that has been envisaged over several years now. And it's been, of course, it's always about money and uh, money's been gradually coming and in 2017, they built a new span, which crosses the four tracks of the Midland Main Line um, in 2017. Um, I wasn't, we weren't involved with this. This was done by others before our time, um, but that uh, is a new structure there, uh, a box girder based on the uh, standard design of, of the Western region called the uh, Western region box girders. They're always called. In fact, I may tell you they're actually invented by the London Midland region, the first one of 1960. And the first one ever built is just north of Leicester, in fact, Midland Main Line. But later on, the Western region went on with it um, from about 1966. And there were, there were dozens, if not hundreds of these. And these box girders, trapezoidal box girders are now a, a standard network rail design. So that was built in 2017, but the dream, uh, the aim is to fill this gap in. And there's more to do than just build this bridge across the Midland Main Line. There are other bridges just south of there and a long embankment as well. So there is a lot to do and it's been going on for some years and it will go on for several more years um, as um, funding is obtained. And you can see an enlargement of that uh, what's called the link. Um, the present Loughborough station is, is just south of there. Um, and then the link will run across the Grand Union Canal and then several other bridges in this area across the Midland Main Line and then join the northern section there with a link, a permanent link onto the main line is possible so that uh, heritage trains will, will be able to travel from one to the other in the future, plus commercial traffic as well. So that's the long-term aim. Um, donate, donations were made by Network Rail. They donated two of their box girders, which came out of Reading when the Reading huge development was being done over, the, over about 10 years ago. Um, these two bridges were donated, again, of this box girder type, known as the Western Region box girders. Now the bridge over the Grand Union Canal I mentioned. Um, when I first became a volunteer on the Great Central about three years ago, um, I came and had a look at this one. And eventually, um, of course, I made some comments about it. And then the cavalry were called in, the firm, Cass Haywood in other words, to decide what to do. And one of the first things was to decide do we try and repair this bridge? And you can see there, bottom left, there was quite severe corrosion of top flanges here. Um, so the question of what do we do? Do we try and repair this bridge or do we reconstruct it? So this is a series of sketches on the, the sort of decision making and the um, question of comparing costs and so on. But it was decided as the, the condition actually wasn't too bad if you could replace these corroded flanges and some other work at the ends of the girders, you should be able to restore the bridge. So it was decided to repair and not reconstruct. And this is always quite a difficult decision. And it was over a period probably of uh, 
approaching two years for the Great Central to, to decide which option to go for. It's a question of money, of course, as always. Looking at the underside of the bridge there, you can see uh, this is during the, the repairs and it all looks pretty good and it was. And we can be grateful for the water, waterproofing system that was applied to the old floor of the bridge. And um, asphalt was very well adhered and asphalt uh, pretty good material actually if properly done in waterproofing the deck of the bridge. So the repairs underneath were really not too much, but at the ends where the girders uh, bear on the abutments, then there was severe, very severe corrosion. You can see a gaping hole in the web and severe corrosion of the bottom flange. So obviously something had to be done here. And what was done was a new overplating or patching of stiffening uh, and web of the girder has been done here and the bottom flange renewed. So you might ask, how on earth do you replace the bottom flange uh, when it's resting on the abutment? And the answer is a thing called the Cass Hayward's coat hanger, which is um, a pair of beams um, straddling the three girders with jacking facilities at all three places. Um, the red object on the left is a counterweight. Um, so what you do is uh, anchor down at the left hand side and raise up the right hand girder on jacks. Uh, lift it up just enough to uh, do, the, do the work and then swap, around, swap everything around and do the other side and then do the middle as well by jacking and supporting at the uh, outer girders. So that got done. The a very experienced contractor, Centigrate, uh, were brought in to do this. Um, it's really essential to have an a very experienced contractor to do this kind of work. And there are not many firms around to do this. So that bridge got sorted out. Now, about a year ago, um, it is now just over a year ago, um, as a volunteer, the Great Central Railway uh, said, can you come and have a look at this bridge? We're a bit worried about it. It's a little farm access bridge um, carrying the uh, two track Great Central line. Um, come and have a look. Doesn't look too bad, does it, from the outside? And the bottom right photo is sort of condition of it just after uh, British Railways closed it. So it's um, steel girders from 1899. And of course, that was the start of steel. Um, steel was first used on the fourth railway bridge in 1890, but it was in the early days of steel. And the Great Central were quite astute about it. They decided to use steel, but use the working stresses of wrought iron, which were only five tons per square inch, whereas in steel, they could have used six and a half tons per square inch. But very fortunate that they had this um, attitude of being a little conservative. And I think we can always be grateful for the Victorians to uh, having conservative uh, approaches, which means that the bridge has a, perhaps a higher factor of safety than we would use now. So I went up a ladder with my torch and my chipping hammer and hammered away and uh, explored around uh, the ends of the girders, partly concealed by these ballast walls. And this is what I found, gaping great holes in the webs. Um, every web uh, wasn't uh, corroded to that amount, but they were all holed to some extent or other. So I decided um, this is something to be worried about. So uh, along with the um, Great Central engineer, this is Alan Brassi who looks after the infrastructure on the Great Central. Um, I said, well, what about running an engine across and see if we can detect any movements? So they called up the 08 shunter and uh, we ran that across a few times up and down on both tracks um, while we went underneath and tried to detect whether things were moving. I think that's always valuable if you've got a bridge in trouble. Um, see it under traffic and see what, see what moves at the bearings, if anything, and what deflection occurs. That's very, very vital information. Well, we got some minor movements, a bit inconclusive, but I decided we've got a problem here. What I had in mind was um, there had been a major collapse uh, on the main lines just north of Carlisle um, in 2009. This bridge, a total collapse um, where girders had been hidden by 
ballast and by timber boarding up against the girders. And over the years, corrosion, you can see the line of corrosion there. And then the, when a train went over, which was um, 100 ton wagons and a class 66 locomotive went across at speed. The engine got across, the wagons didn't. And you can see this classic um, shear failure at the ends. I always think shear failure is, is much more critical than bending. Bending is a, generally a slow action and you can see deflection. Shear failures are always sudden, so they're things to be aware of. So this was a classic shear failure caused by really um, lack of maintenance because maintenance and inspection was impossible. Um, they had, there was bad luck on this bridge because it was about to be, they knew it was in bad condition and the new deck had actually been ordered, um, but um, they were a little bit late and the bridge collapsed before the renewal could be done. So that was the sort of thing that uh, you have in your mind really. So what to do um, on the bridge at Loughborough? Well, I, um, I was called up to see the uh, general manager of the Great Central and he said, you've got a problem here, have you? And I said, you certainly have. Um, you need to put a speed restriction on that bridge and prop it immediately. Um, so this is a cross section of what we did consider, which was to prop the bridge by some props against the abutments, uh, keyed in at the bottom and um, tied in uh, and to support the span. The point is the steelwork was actually in pretty good condition on its span. It was just at the ends uh, where the shear failure might occur. And we would support the bridge temporarily with uh, folding wedges. I've always been a fan of folding wedges. You can always bang them in a bit harder if they're loosening when things begin to chatter a bit. But the Great Central took the decision that rather than have that, and it would still have meant a speed restriction, even with this temporary propping. And the point being that um, the Great Central do run uh, guest trains, network rail test trains for running uh, new equipment on, and which can travel at up to 75 miles per hour. Although, as you probably all know, and I should have mentioned earlier, all these heritage railways are really limited to 25 miles per hour. And I think it's 20 miles per hour in Scotland, um, but 25 is the normal speed limit. Uh, and obviously at 75, uh, this sort of temporary propping would be perhaps be a bit shaky and highly temporary. Um, so Great Central took the decision, no, we'll renew the deck. So decision made, renew the deck and to use precast concrete units. Um, that was what was gone for. You can see the old cross section above. I was slightly reassured when I looked at the bridge that there are at least two girders underneath every rail. So if any one did fail, then you've got the other one. So it's unlikely on that bridge would have ever collapsed. But I told um, Great Central that you might conceivably have a risk of a derailment. So you've got to do something about it. So Cleveland Bridge, the big firm came in again and um, turned their hands to precast concrete. And for the erection, they decided not to use a traditional crane, but to use the modern way to do it, very often in bridges, is to use these uh, mobile transporters, which really came in in the late 1980s for the North Sea oil industry originally. Have the beauty of being able to turn on a sixpence and um, carry very heavy loads um, and erect bridges. I mean, it's not always the answer, but it's a very good way. Um, notice a temporary road has been built um, that was pretty necessary. This was a rather boggy sort of uh, farm track uh, to bring the bridge in. I know of three bridges that have had problems using these mobile transporters. Uh, one was in about U2001 near Shrewsbury. Um, it's a bridge we had actually designed um, and the bridge got stuck while it was being installed um, in very rainy weather. Um, a similar thing happened in around the 1990s, removing a, a concrete bridge on the M4, um, just east of the Severn Bridge. And again, one of these transporters got stuck in the mud. Um, and last year, another one got stuck near Bristol, a rail bridge, a very heavy structure. 
again, um, in all three cases, very rainy weather in the days before and ground which was not really suitable. So very important point, although on this bridge, we're only carrying about 70 tons here. I mean, it's a, it's a lightweight. Uh, even so, it was worth producing a, a proper temporary road. And Cleveland Bridge very responsibly did that. So here's the uh, bridge being installed, coming in there. Notice the bearings are rubber strip, um, a continuous rubber strip to give you a, a low sort of low pressures onto the old abutments, which were in very good condition. But you can see that there's a variation between bedstone and brickwork and then back to bedstone. So it was a bit uh, sort of uneven. Um, so to spread it all out, the elastomeric bearings do that onto a substantial 300 by 25 continuous steel spreader plate. And that's an economic way of spreading um, the load out rather than renewing the bedstones, which were in very good condition, actually. But um, I think it was justified uh, reconstructing when you can see after the old bridge came out, the condition of the ends of those girders. And at least one of the con competing contractors did say, there's no way you can repair that. Well, I suppose you can almost repair anything, but that would have been a bit of a challenge. And there's the uh, completed um, parapet and the old Great Central, very attractive parapet has gone back. And Cleveland Bridge took the old one back to their works and uh, restored it nicely. And um, some of the, these all look like rivets, but some of them are, are in fact TC bolts, which are um, high tensile bolt, uh, which has a rounded head and makes a very good imitation rivet actually. By the way, TC bolts, they're a modern um, thing have come in, I suppose, the last 15 years, but they are really a, a regurgitated version of the Torshear bolt that came out in the 1950s. So it's a really modern version of the Torshear bolt, is the TC bolt. There are some other bridges on Great Central, um, which I have looked at, but they've got to have a proper inspection on them yet. There are several bridges like this. Um, the Great Central um, call them uh, hog arches, but in fact they, the real name is Hobson Metal Flooring, um, which was uh, an invention of a, a gentleman called Hobson um, on the Great Central Railway. A very efficient method of construction, curved steel plates resting on just T-sections riveted, um, and this is in fact a patented system used for short span floors and bridges. And again, very short span bridges, about um, 12 foot clear span, four meters. And at the end, you can see there is some corrosion, but not too bad. And this uh, Hobson metal flooring was in fact patented by um, George Hobson uh, in connection with the Liverpool Overhead Railway. He had a lot of irons in lots of fires he did, but he worked with uh, Sir Douglas Fox and Partners on design of the great central London extension in the late 1890s. It's a very efficient method of construction actually, but used in floors. And that's not actually outdated today if you were to use that. Quite a good system. Um, now this, this is some repairs that uh, are only just envisaged, um, but if it's proven that the condition of it, it requires it and the loading is uh, inadequate, we had in mind uh, casting a concrete slab over the top, making it composite with the arch. Uh, to improve the strength. But certainly at the ends where the we rest on the abutments, it might be an idea if necessary, and the corrosion is there, to just plug the end with concrete, just plug the end of the uh, arch really to get the load onto the abutment. That may be all that's necessary. It may be on some of these, there's nothing to do at all, but this is just something we're considering. Well, I'm moving on to another railway now, the Rother Valley Railway, which is really going to be a future extension of the Kent and East Sussex, which is a, um, a light railway, if you like, uh, down in Kent. Um, and uh, to complete that into the town of Robertsbridge, the idea is this short extension called the Rother Valley Railway um, to join the whole thing up. And there are several small bridges there. 
this is an area uh, very prone to flooding. And um, I've been doing some other considerations of building new bridges, not out of bridges, but by uh, just multiple concrete pipes uh, to form pipe culverts really, maybe a way of doing it. But some of these bridges have um, been replaced that were in bad state. And this is one of them, Bridge 5 at Roberts Bridge. Sorry. Let's go back up to the full screen again. And um, what's been done here is to uh, replace the decks, which are in a bad state, um, by recovered girders um, from a bridge at Staplehurst, also in, down in Kent. And Staplehurst is a somewhat famous place where there was a derailment in 1865 on longitudinal timbers, I may say, um, with cast iron trough beams. We, and the timbers were being replaced at the time. And uh, as they were replacing them, a boat train came along they weren't expecting, which was not in the schedule, and ploughed uh, into this bridge, which was uh, the rails had been uh, partly removed and the, the bridge collapsed under the, the train, the, some of the cast iron girders collapsed and the train collapsed. Uh, but who was on board other than Charles Dickens? And Charles Dickens has written about this and you'll find this written up in other places. A quite famous derailment. So those uh, cast iron beams had to be replaced by these beams, which in turn were replaced by precast concrete some years ago. So the Rother Valley um, were able to take uh, these on and five bridges have been replaced um, using these old beams. You can see these cleats where the longitudinal timbers ran, but that's been replaced by a ballasted track. So it's quite a good use for those beams. And you can see one of these bridges here. And in fact, at this one, the abutments were in terrible condition as well and had to be replaced. And the abutment is actually formed of a complete U trough so the concrete runs underneath. So it's a complete U shape in uh, in situ concrete. And then the new, or the second hand girders are just with new cantilevers forming uh, walkways. And uh, another second hand arrangement. Um, about 10 years ago, I happened to be traveling on a train uh, through Reading where the extensive new works at Reading were being done and I saw this bridge which looked as though it was about to be demolished and taken out at a place called Cow Lane just west of Reading station and I saw the span of it and that looks about 10 meters and the skew of it looks about right to a bridge there thinking of down at the Robber Valley. So um, I looked into it and managed to get the drawings out of a network rail and it would pretty well exactly fit what Rother Valley wanted. So I had a meeting with John Shreves, who was involved and the um, other people, the contractor working at Reading. And it was agreed to contractor would sell these girders, um, stick them on a lorry and take them down to Kent. So that's what happened. At the moment, they're still being stored in a yard waiting to be used and they will be used uh, on this further extension of the Rother Valley, which is rather delayed at the moment through planning permission, they're trying to get across uh, an A road as a level crossing. So there's a lot of opposition to it from the uh, Department of Transport, but that's hopefully coming along. I'm gonna move on now to the uh, Keithley and Worth Valley Railway, which is quite a short railway, very picturesque um, up in Yorkshire, um, which was the site of where they filmed the uh, railway children in in the 70s, of course. And um, I'm not involved with this bridge, but over the years, um, Keith Lee and Worth have uh, done some quite responsible bridge repairs. And this one goes back a few years, is a quite a large span arch over a river here where frost damage had occurred. Um, and you can see, they removed quite a few of the bricks from the uh, arch there at the edge and some spread of the spandrel walls. Um, spandrel walls are quite vulnerable on uh, these old railway bridges. Over the years, the ballast and, uh, tends to push the walls out and uh, 
over the years, of course, tracks tend to get higher as you read ballast, rails get higher and higher, and you can get into the position where you're in danger of pushing the walls over. And network rail have had recent problems with that in, uh, in Scotland, of course, and elsewhere. So on this bridge, um, Keithley and Worth had to do some repairs, of course. Once again, this bridge is on a curve. All bridges with problems seem to be on curves or very skewed. You can see some of the work going on here um, in supporting uh, whilst the brickwork is replaced and then tying in with uh, through tie rods um, and patris plates on the outside, outside to hold everything together. Arches do tend to spread over the years and so you'll often see this tying arrangement. Another bridge on Keithley and Worth. Uh, was a footbridge over the railway, uh, which was a, a, an old lattice girder structure that was taken down to a works and repaired um, using riveting. And um, the approach spans were actually timber and a lot of renewals were done there. And in fact, the Royal Engineers, these are, are all Royal Engineer uh, guys um, doing the work. And you can see here some of the uh, the work and replacement of these raking timbers. Now, Keith, a recent job um, about two years ago, um, I was asked if I would um, advise them on a, a bridge, um, which I did, and we decided what to do. And then, of course, the cavalry were called in to design it properly. This is a bridge, a uh, small bridge, two span over a river. Um, on masonry abutments which were in splendid condition um, but the deck wasn't. Um, the outer beams are cast iron, the inner ones are second-hand girders from somewhere else that were put in in 1903 and were in pretty rather bad condition. The bridge is on a sharp curve um, and the timber floor was totally rotted. I mean that obviously could have been renewed um, but it was decided in view of the vulnerable uh, condition, condition of the bridge and if a derailment occurs on this bridge on a curve, sharp curve like that, of course you're in trouble. So it was decided to reconstruct. And of course flooding is a problem and uh, if floods get much higher than this you could in fact carry the bridge away. So a, a solution was probably to replace in something a bit heavy precast concrete uh, so that it wouldn't float away. Um, so uh, Arthur Walker, um, their chief engineer, came down and to my house about two, it's about two years ago now and we decided how we're going to do the replacement. So we decided to replace in precast concrete and you can see here the old construction coming out here. Um, notice the excellent condition of the uh, piers, the pier and the abutments. And the new deck was made here, was made um, by a specialist uh, in Newark or Tuxford and um, used the shear key deck system, which is a series of uh, precast units with the concrete stitch joints. And we call that a shear key deck. And Arthur Walker there, you see, uh, who was chief engineer of the railway at that time, he's now retired, except he's still working. Uh, the shear key deck system, I think, is an excellent system. It was really developed by British Railways, and the theory of it was developed to, by their doctor, Julian Spendel, uh, from his PhD thesis in 1961, a very renowned engineer on the Midland region. And uh, of course, I originally started with the Midland region of British Rail. I didn't realise at the time what a hotbed of talent was in that office. Um, there were some marvellous people like Spendel. Um, in doing some very inventive bridge work, both steel and in concrete, early pre-stressed concrete work as well. Um, but this shear key deck system um, is very cunning actually. These precast beams are, the theory of it is, the joints act like hinges, or if you like, they act like um, spring door hinges, if you like. They've got a moment capacity, but not full capacity. And the transfer of load 
um, if you apply a concentrated load in one place, the load is spread to the other beams uh, through shear um, through the, the uh, joints and taking making use of the torsional stiffness of the beams. And Spindle produced, uh, say, this whole theory, which was all pre pre computing times, um, and produced a series of graphs. But if and the whole thing became a, a memorandum in the Department of Transport, a technical memorandum bridge BE23 called Shear Key Dex, and it's been used many times. But the uh, Department of Transport withdrew it. And I believe the reason they withdrew it is that it, that it uses graphs and not computer, modern computer design, which is a great pity because what's important is the system. It's a superb system. Does enable you to build bridges half width sometimes if you're building a bridge in two halves, running traffic down one half and while you do the other. It's a very good way of doing that. And no need to thread transverse reinforcing either rebars or pre-stressing. Uh, through holes that sometimes don't line up and um, it's an excellent system um, so why they withdrew that I think it's a, a total mystery really but I just think it's because it was by uh, the theory is by using graphs but you can easily and what has been done of course is to computerize the design method very simple so here's the, the bridge being can reconstructed and we again, we had this magic date of 23rd of March at the start of lockdown last year. Um, the first span got erected and um, unfortunately the site then had to close due to the lockdown. But come July, um, erection again was possible for the second span. And uh, one of the old steam, 50 tonner, um, that's up on the Keithley work, 50 ton steam breakdown crane has been used to do the erection. You can see here the protruding rebars for the joints. And there's the deck ready for concreting. Notice that longitudinal dowel bars are threaded through these joints so that you get a proper anchorage. And all the sort of necessity for the amount of reinforcement in there is all dealt with in BE23. And it was scientifically worked out so that you get sufficient strength in those joints that can act as, if you like, semi-pins, um, transfer shear, but not very much bending moment. And here's the first uh, train, first heritage train in September. Again, of course, before the second lockdown. Uh, fin bridge hasn't been quite finished off. There is the old handrails will be put back and a bit of tidying up at the ends, but it uh, looks pretty smart. In fact, that concrete's almost gleaming in the sun. Very good finish. Well, I'm finally going to move to Barmouth. Now, uh, Barmouth, everyone knows of Barmouth Bridge, um, nearly a kilometre long, and most of it is timber trestle construction, of course. And this isn't a heritage railway, this is a mainline railway, single track, of course. Um, most of the Cambrian lines, as they're called, originally it was the Cambrian Railway years ago before it became the, the Great Western Railway in 1923 and then nationalised in 1948. But uh, nearly a kilometre long, 121 spans, uh, but the spans are about six metres, each one's about six metres long. But at one end, the north end, you've got these uh, steel spans. And uh, this portion was originally a swing bridge, this portion. It hasn't swung since I think the late eighties, um, but that, that section is steel and originally was a drawbridge when first built. Um, but the, um, <coughs> it's a grade two listed structure and uh, currently network rail are upgrading it considerably and they're spending 25 million. By the way, just going back to the Keithley and Worth Valley that I showed, that bridge was done, um, the whole thing, for 150,000. And largely that is because most of the work was by volunteers of the great Keithley and Worth. About half that cost is the precast beams, which were by a specialist, but all the rest of it is by volunteers. And up to 100 volunteers were involved 
on the construction of that bridge. It's a real brave um, undertaking um, to produce a bridge at that price. So moving on to uh, Barmouth then. Over the years, Barmouth, of course, 1867 built originally, over the years, continually, it's kind of every 20 or 30 years, there is a massive renewal has to happen for the timber. It's all always originally built in, originally um, Baltic pine softwood, which came from Germany um, to do all that. But over the years, the timbers had to be progressively replaced. And it's all on longitudinal timbers, of course, on a 20 mile an hour speed restriction and load restriction as well. And uh, for many years, um, locomotives like this used the bridge. Um, these locomotives, they look 19th century, don't they? But they were product of 1936. And they were a rebuild of cannibalized um, locomotives of the previous century, the Dukes and the Bulldogs, which uh, looked something like this, but they cannibalized them in the thirties uh, into these things called Duke Dogs. And they used to still uh, run these until the end of steam in the 1960s. Um, the reason for them is the low axle load, only 15.4 ton axle load, very light. Uh, and that's from low classification RA3, which is pretty low. Um, very desirable, of course, to have uh, light um, locomotives on a structure like this, which has always, always had a speed limit and always, and for many years, they didn't allow double heading. In other words, two, two locomotives coupled together. Um, that was never allowed. Notice a footway alongside has always been there, a public footway, which was a, a toll arrangement at one time. Not I think it's free now. And um, of course, this Barmouth Viaduct has been threatened with closure more than once. In the 60s, it was threatened with closure uh, with the beaching cuts. And in the 80s, was threatened with closure due to worm infestation, infestation, the Torito worms, which were attacking the piles. And um, the solution was to replace a lot of the piles and to sleeve the bottom end in concrete. And so all the piles at Barmouth are sleeved like this, down to low water level. The worms don't like going below low water. They like the areas that are alternately wet and dry between high and low tide. And the worms are still around apparently, but much less. And worms have always been there. I've looked back at papers when the bridge was built in the 1860s. They had worms then. So it's been a continual problem. But the problem was virtually solved by this concrete sleeving and replacing some piles. And the bridge had to be closed, I say, for seven months in, in the 80s for that work to be done. So there have been a lot of scares on this bridge. Would it ever open again? But um, it's been kept going. And with the credit to Network Rail, they're continuing to do so. And <clears throat> there are in fact nine uh, timber viaducts still in mid Wales um, carrying the Cambrian lines. But this of course is the biggest one. Now the timber piles, this is a, a removed pile from another bridge. And you can see that was pulled out as a, just to see what the condition was. And it's in very good condition actually. Um, if piles are underwater, uh, they don't rot. It's only if they partly get exposed to the air um, above um, water level or at or near water level. And the most of the piles or timbers in Barmouth and other bridges are 14 inch by 14 inch Baltic, originally Baltic pine, but replaced as they had to be over the years by uh, other timbers. And you can see here now um, the work that's been going on in the last year or so on replacing. And all replacements now um, on these viaducts are using green heart timber, uh, which is a much heavier, denser timber and a tropical hardwood. And it's very immune to rot. And the life of green heart has been put at well over 50, 50 years. Um, so it can give you a very long life. And these piles will be are being cased, and the, the contractor here has been working on this uh, for the last over the last year or so, doing this replacement work. And you can see the work going on here, <clears throat> and obviously at low tide you can uh, you can walk across. 
the high tide you can't. And so it's a hazardous site, of course. You can see some of the repairs, you can see some rotted timbers, a lot worse than that sometimes. Um, but re power repairs here by resin injection, a, a wooden casing placed around and then inject with resin and, and sometimes resin packing. Uh, when you remove, renew this timber, resin packing um, is used. And if it's a big gap, they would use a hardwood pack. And you can see here, the, no piles are being replaced below low water level. The replacement above water level is by splicing in a new piece of green heart. And you can see the quite good handling equipment here. And this, of course, is all in the last year. You can see mask on here. And these guys are pretty good at social distancing, I think. And um, how is timber replacement uh, done to, at a pier? Um, this device is used, a traveling, there are two of these, I think, on the bridge. Um, these were um, manufactured by Mabies, um, is a, a device which spans from a pier to that pier, and the pier you're working on is in the middle. So that is relieved of load, and you can then jack up and work and replace members at that pier. So this device moves from one pier to another to do the work. And Griffiths here are the main contractor. So now the metal spans are also going to be replaced. Um, we got involved in assessing the metal spans. Uh, I think it was 2009 or so. Um, a thorough inspection and a mathematical assessment. And we got some shocks. Uh, there was quite a bit of corrosion. So we had to rate some of this structure down to about RA2, which is uh, not what it should be. Um, so Network Rail have eventually made the decision to replace the metal spans. But as the historical people are involved, uh, we replace, it's being replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. So it'll look the same, but um, the replacement will use modern welded fabrication um, rather than the riveted work that's there at the moment uh, with certain simplifications. The piers incidentally are in pretty good state. These are large, two, about two and a half diameter cylinders, which are concrete filled. And of course, most of the load is taken by the concrete, um, but they are in reasonable condition. And these cowlings are just a decoration really. Um, that they're all being retained. Um, these cylinders here are the original ones from 18, 67 still remaining. You can see the bridge as built. Um, it was a, a retractable span here, which never seemed to work properly. It took lots of men to open it and close it. And it really wasn't very successful. Um, so that that section, uh, those metal spans uh, in wrought iron were, uh, were replaced by the swing span, um, these spans in uh, 1902 but are now in a bad state and uh, under capacity. In particular, these two spans uh, have very, very weak U-frame uh, stability. So reconstruction is going to happen from, from this year sometime. You can see one feature um, of um, the metallic spans is that the cross girders are in fact suspended from the main girders originally by rivets, and I've mentioned previously, rivets intention are bad news. Um, if rivet heads corrode, um, then you can just pull through. Um, progressively, they've been replaced by bolts uh, over the years more than once. Um, but this type of construction is not desirable. And in fact, going right back to 1867, the Board of Trade Inspector at the time said, Another defect was that cross girders hung on the heads of rivets in the main girders. And his boss in the same year, Major Hutchinson of the Board of Trade said, cross girders being suspended by rivets, these should be watched and iron straps added. I don't know whether that ever happened, but um, you can see that these guys were very concerned about it, a very responsible set of comments actually. Um, so how did the bridge survive? Well, it's survived by 
periodically replacing these bolts. Now, of course, this isn't the original bridge. So you might say why when they replaced the original bridge by the swing span, why did they use the same method of construction? But it's quite interesting. In the original bridge, the cross girders were at three foot centers. These cross girders are at six foot centers. They replaced the bridge progressively during while traffic was running most of the time by slotting these new cross girders between the old ones and then um, progressively changing the floor while supported by the old girders beneath. And then at a certain stage, they brought in the new main girders and mounted them on top of the cross girders. So you can see that's really the history of why um, the cross girders are under slung in this replacement bridge, it was merely this phase of operation. And I've read this up in the original account of the uh, Mr. Collin, who was the engineer of the Cambrian Railways at the time, um, who designed the bridge. Um, that was what he said. That was the way he had to do it to keep trains running. Uh, but it has led to this unfortunate detail. You can see here the uh, cylinders here, which have been banded over the years to prevent them splitting. There is quite a bit of corrosion on the bridge. I mean, I've seen a lot worse than this. It's got longitudinal timbers, of course, again, a, an undesirable detail. And there is some corrosion here, but um, I've seen worse. But it's enough to uh, really restrict the capacity of the structure. And you can see here a view along the track of the um, swing span. You can see the multiplicity of uh, lacings and members. It really is a, a real Meccano set and bracings over the top. So quite a challenge to change this into welded construction. Um, but we've got proposals for this. You see the existing is um, on the left and you can see the underslung cross girders hanging from the main girders. The longitudinal timbers in troughs, all bad news really, potentially. Um, whereas the re proposal replacement is to use profile cut uh, members here to form the lacings and to form the cross girders, although they look as though they're under slung, well, they are in a way, but at least you're using bolts in shear and not tension. And the floor members um, are made all on bottom flanges all on one plane so you can use profile cut plates. So this was to make a, if you like, an economic solution and to reduce the tonnage of steel considerably of course in, uh, in line with um, reducing costs. And this is an impression of what it might look like. This work hasn't been done yet of course. One interesting feature is that the old roller track uh, which is was there when it was is still there uh, when it was a swing bridge which no longer operates the historic people have insisted that that roller track remains even though it does nothing um, so the idea with the new structure is to span over that roller track and just leave it there and you can see here some of the details for improving the fabrication and once again, uh, Picasso's got his pencil out. Um, and at the, this is the arrangement so that the uh, new bridge is supported independently of the old roller track. And this sort of H frame is to span the new bridge onto the equally onto the four cylinders. Whereas in the bridge as existing, you can imagine as a train crosses the bridge, the low tends to rock from one side of this roller track to the other. And it's, uh, it's pretty bad news for the, for the roller track over the years. But now to spread the load equally onto the four cylinders, I say this eight frame, and then disc or rotational bearings are put here so that the bridge is able to deflect um, and still provide constant load onto the four cylinders. And that has the bridge as it might look, but of course that's as it is now. Um, but um, hopefully when it's replaced with uh, welded construction, when you're standing a distance away, you wouldn't know whether it's welded or, or bolted or riveted.
and will have a, a slightly more modern appearance. Um, I must congratulate the uh, photographer Tom Bartlett of Network Rail um, for the magnificent photograph and the splendid scenery. And once again, Picasso is going to get out his paintbrush. And that's the end of the line. So if anyone's got any questions, <laughs> thank you. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent talk. And uh, if you've started your first 10 years barely um, understanding theory, uh, certainly um, you, you certainly caught up and still put a lot of us with many years to shame. Um, there were lots of questions. I, I don't believe we'll have time to answer all of them. So I've made a copy of all of them and I'll send them to Alan and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah. And you, you hopefully we'll get, you might get a, an individual response. One of the yes, first questions- Yes, certainly with pleasure, yes. One of the first questions though, was that Heritage Railways come under the Light Railways Act, but the stock isn't necessarily any lighter. Now in about two minutes, can you just sort of cover what that might mean? Yes, well, of course, um, as you say, the Heritage Railways are often carrying very heavy locomotives that, that use the mainline railways um, until the end of steam. And um, you know, things like Flying Scotsman and of course the new built Tornado will over a hundred tons um, with well over 20 ton axle loads, 22 tons typically. And they would be RA9 in the low classification, the maximum being RA10. So they're, they're pretty well towards modern mainline standards. Of course, the maximum <coughs> is 25 ton axle loads um, is heavy, heavy uh, oil or coal wagons but, um, and ballast wagons. Um, so we're talking about RA9, but of course the heritage railways are maximum 25 miles per hour. So there's very little impact um, um, on the bridges. And of course the hammer blow, which steam, lo steam locos apply, um, is only at this reduced speed of 25 miles per hour. So the loading, in fact, is, is not too bad at all. Um, we're compared with modern loading um, on the mainline system. Uh, we're using the uh, European, standard European loading from 1973, which is standard throughout Europe and in the UK. Um, it's equivalent to some, something higher than RA10. And of course, with impact, of speeds up to 125 miles per hour. And of course, on the high speed lines like HS1 and what will be HS2, um, the loading is higher still. Um, and, and things, factors like vibration and comfort, comfort per passengers come in and we have to use uh, stiffer bridges. Um, but yes, the loading is quite, sounds quite severe, but in fact, because the impact is low, um, it's not, not too bad. And the Heritage Railways, of course, only 25 miles per hour um, because of otherwise damage to what is fairly um, old, fat, old track. Um, and of course, on Heritage Railways, we don't really want high speeds. Um, they're all about riding for pleasure. So um, 25 miles per hour is, is quite enough. But typically, yes, uh, the, on the Heritage Lines, the design loading is typically um, it's always 25 miles per hour, but it's up to RA10. In other words, the full 20 units of what, what was known as RA1 loading, which goes back to 1922. And RA1 loading is still the same system that's used by Network Rail today um, for assessing their bridges. Yeah. That, so the loading, question. although the locomotives are, are no heavier, or no lighter, should I say, um, the impact effects are much less um, at 25 miles per hour. That, that first question was from Steve Matthews. I think you thought he might be one of the first. Oh, uh, so yes. Well, I expected question, something from Steve. <laughs> a related question from Kafui um, with regarding... Uh, uh, because a lot of the older bridges are still there. So he's suggesting we're, we're currently in, enjoy the conservatisms that were built into assets by the Victorians. However, current designs tend to be lean. So, Alan, do you think current design would benefit from some more fat for the benefit of future generations? Well, they might do. I mean, we're using very sophisticated design methods now, and we think we're getting everything exactly right, which we are, but there's no margin for future changes. Um, uh, the changes being corrosion, for one thing, and general degradation, 
and we haven't got much built in for that. Whereas the Victorian bridges, I mean, the, um, the steel, for example, a six and a half ton a square inch, very low. And that's typically a factor of safety against total failure of four. Uh, I mean, again, we now use yield stress rather than ultimate, but it still represents the Victorians were on a factor of safety of about three, at least three. Whereas under Eurocodes, we're talking of something less than two, about 1.8 or something like that. So there's not much in hand. And again, we're now talking about using higher strength steel, the S S460 and even higher, which means we're going to be on quite um, small section sizes. And I just think for the future, we've got to be so much more careful about maintenance and inspection than we have been in the past. Yeah. So design standards now do have a provision for an extra 1.1 or 10% to allow for um, sort of degradation. Well, that's true for future growth. And yeah. I think on the high speed lines, they're multiplying by another 10%. So the factor is 1.21 on the normal um, LM71 European loading. So there's a bit of fat there, but there's not as much as fat as, as the Victorians had. And they were building in fat um, unintentionally, I suppose, but it's a jolly good thing they did. Yes. Um, you did an excellent talk a few years ago on um, almost the history of railway loading. And I suspect from those questions, it's probably a talk that's worth doing again. Um, it must be seven or eight years, Alan, since you did that one. Yes. Um, I think I was due to give it to last year sometime in, I think it was in um, Cheshire branch, but of course that didn't happen due to the COVID problems. Yeah. One of the, another early question was regarding the footbridge, I think at Lydney, uh, whether the um, corrosion there, was it completely replaced? And if so, was it reattached by welding, bolting or riveting? Can you remember? No, it was all, all by bolting. Okay. Um, and then an interesting one, the fact that from Shanks are, I don't know if that's a Mr. Shanks, um, but one good question with the use of the Kirov crane again at North Yorks, that's obviously quite a heavy bit of rolling stock. And what um, was done in terms of assessing the capacity of the abutments for, for that crane? Well, to carry the crane. Yeah. But well, of course when the crane is running, it's, I think it's RA7 or something. Um, and when it, um, because it's got uh, relieving bogies at each end or Stokes bogies, we used to call them, bogies which um, at each end of the crane, um, in effect, the, the crane jacks itself onto those bogies. So it's spread among a large number of wheels. But when it's um, working as a crane, those bogies are disconnected or they come off so you can get nearer to the bridge and um, then yes you are putting quite big loading so you could and of course you have outriggers um, and they the, the loads from the outriggers have to be properly spread by temporary works um, but yes you are sometimes putting quite heavy loadings just behind abutments so you've got to be you know quite careful about that yeah um, obviously, with the um, mainline bridges, Network Rail have their approving um, standards and that. So uh, a question relating to the heritage railways and what standards do they use and do they have sort of some sort of similar uh, technical approval process? Yes. Um, yes. I mean, uh, sophisticated designs, yes, would have, you know, category checks. No, they can, it comes under the same rules. Yeah, I think they come under the office of the rail regulator anyway, yes. don't they? So they oh, yes. By, oh, uh, yes. Like, I mean, they're, a, they're carrying public. They've got to work to the same standards, and they do. Yeah. Uh, an interesting question um, from Raj in terms of uh, related to his experience of assessment. Um, you've referred to deterioration and corrosion, um, and that's led to a lot of the superstructure replacements that you've demonstrated. Um, the question is, have you come across a situation of incorrect design or incorrect design detailing resulting in the failure of the superstructure? If yes, what was it? I mean, of course, the cast iron bridges that were used, a lot of those were collapsing, which led to a major reconstruction in the end of the 19th century. Um, 
but have you still sort of witnessed or seen incorrect design itself? Um, yes, I mean, the, cu the cast iron ones, most of the failures were through blowholes in the tension flange. And uh, in, those, in early days, you couldn't detect those blowholes. You, you would do it by NDT these days, but they often had blowholes in them and there were quite a number of failures. And the famous one was um, Norwood Junction in 1891. And after that, they decided to ban cast iron beams in railway bridges and get rid of them. Um, well, that took some time. In the 1960s, I was still involved with replacing cast iron bridges, even under the West Coast Main Line. So, they, so the process of getting rid of those bridges took 70 years. But cases of bad design, I, I can't think of anything particularly. No. Um, but I, I guess inspection of, I've mentioned the ends of girders, which you can't get at for inspection. I suppose you could call that bad design if you like. And with modern bridges, we, we're quite fussy now about being able to see um, all parts of the bridge as far as, far as you practically can yeah. around the ends of the beams and so on. We like to get there and see what's going on. That's great. I think we'll, we've got time for one more because I think the Zoom that uh, we booked it for will kick us out otherwise. But... Um... Yeah, I mean, just a general one and whether there's any sort of publications that you can think of, uh, guidance literature on the repair of sort of bridges that you've come across that may be worth recommending to our listeners. Um, no, I can't think of anything too much, actually. Um, so the, well, going back, there are various papers, institution of civils um, on, on repairing existing structures. They're quite some of them go back to the 1950s now, but they're still worth reading and how um, girders were repaired by patching plates on and that, that sort of thing. And of course, there are more up-to-date methods of um, repairing metallic beams and concrete beams by you know, like sticking on bits, if you like. <laughs> OK. Well, Alan, I, I'm sure that the 205 or 206 of us, including me, uh, have been enthralled with what you've said. And uh, if we were in one of the main lecture theatres, we'd be able to um, give a, a resounding uh, round of applause. Um, we could either all unmute and do it, or, or we can use that little reaction thing at the bottom and uh, clap um, virtually. Um, <laughs> but you won't be able to see us all anyway. Uh, but the, clap, the, clap, the claps are coming in. So, Alan, thank you very much.